The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this lecture on nonlinear finite element analysis of solids and structures. In this lecture, I would like to continue with our discussion of solution methods that we used to solve the finite element equations in nonlinear static analysis. We considered already in the previous lecture a number of solution techniques to solve this set of equations. t plus delta tr is equal to t plus delta tf, where t plus delta tr is the load vector of externally applied loads at time t plus delta t, and t plus delta tf is the nodal point force vector corresponding to the internal element stresses at time t plus delta t. We talked about the full newton raphson method, the modified newton raphson method, the BFGS method, the initial stress method, and we discussed also convergence criteria. I've summarized here the equations corresponding to the modified Newton iteration. Now, a distinguishing feature of these solution techniques is that the analyst has to prescribe the externally applied load vector corresponding to all load steps. This means schematically that if you have this kind of displacement load curve or load displacement curve shown here in red, the analyst has to prescribe prior to the analysis the load levels at which the response is sought. I've here indicated 1R as a load level corresponding to load step 1, 2R as a load level corresponding to load step 2, etc. Of course, the corresponding solutions that the analyst is looking for are the displacements. Now, what might very well happen in practical analysis is that the analyst chooses certain load levels, and at a particular load level, convergence difficulties are encountered. Too many iterations are required to converge, for example, in a reasonable uh, number of, uh, in a reasonable cost. And typically, say, if this happens at this load step here, the analyst decides to restart. And this means that a solution corresponding to R4 here was not obtained. I'm scratching that out. And the analyst restarts now with a smaller load step namely indicated by these green lines here. The solution is obtained corresponding to that uh, configuration, corresponding to that configuration, that configuration, which corresponds in this particular case now to the level of R4 because we have three load steps to reach now R4. And say, at this point now, again, for example, we may encounter solution difficulties. The analyst is not able to obtain this solution here. Once again, the load step has to be uh, smaller to continue the analysis. A restart is necessary at this particular configuration. And like this, the analyst tries to get closer and closer to the collapse load. The conclusion is that we have difficulties in calculating the collapse loads uh, when we use the techniques that I described in the last lecture. Uh, of course, if you restart enough, if you use small enough load steps, you will ultimately get very close to this collapse load, but this is tedious in a practical analysis, and we would like to have really an automatic scheme that directly can trace out the collapse load and can also go into the post-collapse response, which is the response beyond this ultimate limit load here. Well, I've prepared some view graphs to show you and discuss with you a solution technique that actually can be employed to trace automatically the load displacement response out and go beyond the collapse load as well. The idea is that we want to obtain more rapid convergence in each load step. We want to have the program automatically select load increments and we want to also be able to solve for the post-buckling response. Now, this here means, of course, that a priori, 
prior to the analysis, you may not know, in fact you do not know, for which loads you will obtain the solution. You will get the total load displacement response curve, but the discrete load levels at which the response was calculated is being decided by the program. An effective solution would proceed as follows, schematically of course. Here we have the load axis, here we have the displacement axis. The solution scheme would start with large load increments in the region where the response is almost linear. Then cut the load increments to a smaller size and capture of course the ultimate limit load here and then decreases the load as shown here to go into the post-buckling, post-collapse response and could the solution scheme of course could continue up this branch as well. And the solution scheme should automatically select the load step sizes depending on the convergence that has been encountered in the previous load steps. We compute now t plus delta tr using this equation here. Notice that in this equation t plus delta t lambda is an unknown scalar that is going to be determined by the program and r is a vector that gives a particular load distribution. r is constant. It may contain the contributions of surface pressures, of concentrated loads, uh, etc. The point is that r is constant and the program will automatically adjust lambda. Therefore, we assume in our collapse analysis that the loads are increasing and decreasing all in the same way as decided by one scalar. Of course, one could extend this algorithm, such an algorithm, by introducing another vector, calling this R1, introducing a vector R2 with another scalar, and then have two scalars that have to be adjusted automatically by the program, and perhaps one can even think of three scalars and so on, but then the algorithm would become quite complicated. So we look at a scheme that only has one scalar here and one load vector that remains constant throughout, so, so, throughout the solution. As an example, for example here you see in blue the load intensity T lambda R. Notice a concentrated load here, a pressure load here, and at uh, the time T plus delta T we have the red intensity T plus delta T lambda R and of course, this concentrated load has increased in the same way as the pressure has increased, as shown right here. The basic approach of the solution scheme is shown on this view graph. Here we have the load displacement curve that we are looking for, shown in red again. Of course, loads plotted vertically, displacements plotted horizontally. Now, notice that if this is an equilibrium point, the red dot, and if you as the analyst were to choose an increment in load shown by this black line, I'm putting my pointer now onto it, then you can see that this black line defined by this load increment would mean that we have a large number of iterations necessary that we need a large number of iterations to converge to the new equilibrium configuration. In fact, you can see that this red curve is almost parallel to the black line. So we can anticipate large convergence difficulties trying to get to a solution with the load increment being equal from here to that black line. The important feature of the algorithm that I want to present to you now is that this load level is the first load level with which we start in the iteration, but then the algorithm automatically cuts down this load level as shown by this arc here, by the blue arc, until the, this equilibrium point is solved for. And this means that the convergence is much increased. In other words, it is not, the algorithm does not have great difficulties calculating this particular equilibrium point. And from here, of course, the same is repeated. And like this, the algorithm goes along this uh, red load displacement curve and traces this whole curve out.
Let us look a bit at the notation that I will be using uh, because it's important that we get familiar with it uh, at this stage. Notice T lambda R, of course, is the load at time T. The corresponding displacement is Tu. We used that notation earlier already. Notice that the increment in displacement from time t to time t plus delta t is u, shown here in green. Notice that the increment in the load from time t to time t plus delta t is, of course, given by the change in this load factor here. And that change in the load factor is lambda. Now, this lambda value is also given in this equation here. It's buried in there. Notice this lambda i here. We are writing it as a sum of delta lambda k's. We will solve for, these diff for all these delta lambda k's. And this lambda i, when i becomes very large, converges to the lambda that I have up here. Similarly, this ui, which is written as the sum of the delta u k's, this ui converges to the u that, I've, that I'm showing here. So u and lambda, shown in green here, are the exact values, the values that we want to converge to with lambda i and ui. Notice once again, delta lambda k, summing all these delta lambda k's up, we get lambda i, and summing all the delta u k's up, we get ui. We should keep that in mind for the uh, discussion that we want to go through just now. The governing equations are now as follows. On the left hand side we have still a tangent stiffness matrix. In the modified Newton iteration we would have tau equal to t. Delta ui is our displacement increment vector. This is here the scalar t plus delta t lambda i unknown. This one we know and that one we want to calculate in the iteration i. In other words, this is an increment that is unknown at the beginning of the iteration. Here we have the nodal point force vector corresponding to the element stresses at time t plus delta t and at the end of iteration i minus 1. Notice that this is a set of linear equations. In the unknowns, delta u's, there are n such unknowns, and there is one more unknown here, so we have n equations in n plus 1 unknowns. We need, therefore, one more equation. And that equation is given by this constraint equation. The f here uh, on delta lambda and delta u, some constraint equation here, gives us the additional equation that we need for the solution of these n plus 1 coupled equations. The unknowns, of course, are these values here n plus 1 unknowns. To solve these equilibrium equations, we can rewrite them as shown here. Uh, in other words, the equations on the finite element displacements can be split up, if you look at the previous view graph, directly into two sets of equations as shown here. The interesting point is that this equation here does not involve a delta lambda. This equation here does not involve a delta lambda either. Now, having calculated from this equation this vector and from that equation that vector, we can directly write delta u as shown here, of course now involving the delta lambda. And this is the form of equation for delta u that we will be using a little later. As a first constraint equation, I'd like to introduce you to the one that I briefly mentioned earlier already, where we talked about an arc by which is used to swing the load level around so as to get to the load displacement curve very quickly. And that constraint equation is the spherical constant arc length criterion, which is written here. Notice here lambda i. Here ui, of course both of these quantities squared in essence, a beta factor and delta L squared. Delta L is set at the beginning of the iteration. 
It's the beginning of, beginning of the load step, I should say. Delta L, in other words, is constant throughout the load step. The value of delta L is chosen based on what has happened in the previous load steps. Having chosen delta L, we can calculate the right-hand side. And on the left-hand side, we have a constraint between the increment in lambda and the increment in delta U. Remember, lambda i is the sum of all the delta lambda k's. And ui is the sum of all the delta u k's. I just showed that on the previous view graph. Therefore, if we substitute here, we get a constraint equation between the delta u k and the delta lambda k. Well, here we have the definitions once more. Notice beta is a normalizing factor such which is applied in order to make these terms here dimensionless. The equation may be solved as follows. Using that lambda is equal to this equation here. Ui is given as that. Of course, this here can be expanded using the information that we discussed earlier. And substituting for this value and that value into the constraint equation, we directly obtain a quadratic equation in delta lambda i. Remember that these two vectors these two vectors here are, of course, known. These two vectors are known, and that one is known also because that was established in the previous iteration. If we geometrically interpret this solution scheme, we find the following. Here we have our equilibrium point. Here is delta lambda, which is constant throughout the solution step. and Let's assume we use the modified newton raphson iteration. We start off with this tangent here at this solution point, the equilibrium point. And we iterate around this arc using the constant stiffness matrix at each of these points. In the first iteration, we, go, we get to this point, second iteration that point, third iteration that point. And that is signified also uh, uh, looking here to the displacements. Notice t plus delta t u1 is the displacement value calculated at in the first iteration. This is the one calculated in the second iteration. That is the one calculated in the third iteration. We use a constant stiffness matrix here. Of course, we could also change the stiffness matrix, go, in other words, to a stiffness matrix that is being updated in the iteration corresponding to the current stress and displacement conditions. And then convergence would uh, be more rapid. But of course, there would also be a higher cost involved, because whenever we calculate a new stiffness matrix and we triangulize that stiffness matrix, there's a considerable cost involved in doing so. This is one scheme. And we find this scheme quite effective, except that when we want to calculate limit loads, uh, we find that near the limit load, the scheme can require quite a number of iterations. And so we have been looking for other schemes that might do better uh, in the range of the limit load. Well, and here we have one, ski one other scheme, namely the constant increment of external work criterion. Uh, we have here quotes on the constant because we are setting w on the right-hand side in the first iteration, as shown here. And in the next iteration, then, we have a 0 here. Notice w is a value that is calculated in each load step. And as soon as we find that uh, the first scheme, in other words, the constant arc length criterion scheme, uh, has difficulties converging or marches too slow, then we switch to this constant increment of external work criterion with the w from the previous step the increment of external work from the previous step. We use that for the current step. And then this equation here gives us a constraint on delta lambda 1. Notice that this equation here uh, means really that we are looking at this area here, the shaded area being w. And we want to have the delta lambda 1 in such a way that this shaded area w here is equal to 
what we have had as the increment of external work in the previous load step. Well, this gives us delta lambda 1. And having obtained delta lambda 1, we can go into the next iteration. Iterations, I should say. 2 to 3 and so on for i. And as I mentioned already earlier, we then have a 0 on the right-hand side, otherwise the same left-hand side. And this left-hand side has now two solutions. This solution here is disregarded because the, this solution would reverse the direction of the load. And we don't want to admit that. We want to basically have the load increase more and more until the total collapse of the structure is reached. And then, of course, it may decrease to go into the post-buckling response. But we don't want to have the load totally reverse. And so this is the solution that we now use for delta lambda i. Notice that for a single degree of freedom system, we would immediately find that delta u2 must be 0. Why? Because we notice that the load vector is orthogonal to the displacement vector. Now, for a single degree of freedom system, of course, each of these are just numbers. And since the load is not 0, the r, rather, is not 0, because that is, of course, a prescribed value prior to the analysis, this is not 0. Delta u2 must be 0. And that shows already the effectiveness, uh, just shows it a bit uh, of this algorithm. Our algorithm altogether is now as follows. We specify R. In other words, the analyst has to specify the load distribution, concentrated loads, distributed loads, that shall be dealt with in this collapse analysis. And also the displacement at one degree of freedom corresponding to delta t lambda. This is done to just start the algorithm. Once we have once the analyst has specified the displacement at one degree of freedom, the this program can solve for delta t u, in other words, all the other displacements. And this delta t u corresponds to delta t lambda. We feel that to start the algorithm, it is easier for the analyst to prescribe the displacement at one node corresponding to delta t lambda. Uh, rather to pre uh, prescribe this displacement than to prescribe the first load level. Because if you don't have much of an idea how the structure really behaves, it can be very difficult to give a load level that is reasonable and is not too close to the ultimate limit load, or is already perhaps even beyond the ultimate limit load. So we feel that this is here a, way, a good way to proceed. For example, if you analyze the collapse of a shell, you may want to pick a node that you know will have a non-zero displacement and assign at that node a displacement, say, one third of the thickness of the shell. That displacement then will give you delta t lambda and surely will be less than the ultimate limit load of the shell. This means once you have solved for delta t lambda and delta t u, we can set delta l the arc lengths for the next load step. And now the program does everything automatically. It selects uh, the increment in displacements and loads using this arc length criterion that we just discussed. We use 1, which is the arc length criterion, for the next load steps. We calculate w for each load step when w does not change appreciably or when there are difficulties with the arc length criterion, with one in other words, then we switch to our constant increment in external work criterion. We call that the two criterion. Once again, notice that delta L is calculated in each load step. And it is adjusted based on the number of iterations that we have been using in the previous load steps. In other words, uh, you go, say, up to load step 3, and uh, you have, say, obtained the solution up to load step 3. You have used a certain delta L in load step 3. The program has used a certain delta L in load step 3, I should say. 
And now the program looks at the number of iterations that were performed to get to the equilibrium position at the end of load step three. Based on these number of iterations, the program then cuts delta L down or makes delta L larger, depending on whether the iterations were very many that you used or were very few to get to the equilibrium configuration at load step three. So the program automatically adjusts delta L. Also notice that the stiffness matrix is recalculated when convergence is slow. In fact, a full newton raphson iteration is performed automatically. The program switches automatically from the modified newton raphson iteration to the full newton raphson iteration when it is deemed to be more effective. This is the automatic load incrementation scheme that I wanted to discuss with you. And I now like to go over to one other topic, a very important topic as well in the analysis of uh, the nonlinear response of structures. And this is the linearized buckling analysis. In the linearized buckling analysis, we want to predict a collapse load, a buckling load of the structure via this criterion here. The determinant we know at a collapse point of the stiffness matrix is zero. Uh, the matrix is, in other words, singular. The criterion that we use here, determinant of k is equal to zero, of course means, once again, the k matrix is singular, and that means that we are really have a solution to this set of equations that is non-trivial. A trivial solution, of course, would always be u star is equal to zero, but that is not a real solution that we are interested in. A solution, a non-trivial solution exists only under the case to this, to this set of equations, only in the case when tau k is singular. And of course, that is the same as saying that the determinant of k, tau k, is equal to zero. If tau k is singular, the structure is unstable, and uh, the, a collapse load, in other words, uh, a collapse load situation has been reached. Let's look at what this means physically. If we have here a beam, if you look at a beam, pinned at this end, pinned at that end, subjected to a certain load, then if the load takes on a certain value, the smallest imbalance of the load, a fairly small load this way, would immediately result in very large displacements. That's what the buckling criterion tells us. In other words, at tau r, the buckling load, the structure is unstable to any smallest load imbalance. Of course, the material data for the structure are given, and in this particular case, we use the data of an elastic beam. In the linearized buckling analysis, we want to predict the load level and the buckling load shape corresponding to the uh, buckling situation by linearizing about a particular configuration that is not necessarily very close to the buckling load level. In fact, we assume that tau k is given via this relationship here, and tau r is given via this relationship. Notice here t minus delta tk and tk are known values, known stiffness matrices, and similar to these load vector, and that load vector, and that one, are known values. Lambda is a scalar. So basically what we are trying to do in the linearized buckling analysis is to linearize about a configuration not necessarily very close to the collapse load configuration and establish with this linearized relationship uh, an equation from which we can calculate an increment in load an increment in load that tells us that gives us an approximation to the actual collapse load Pictorially, we are doing this here. We have here the load displacement curve in red. We have at, time, at 
displacement t minus delta t u, this load level. At displacement t u, we have that load level. And if we linearize about these configurations here, using the stiffness matrices corresponding to these two load levels, we can predict a collapse load, which, because of this linearization, is, of course, not exactly the collapse load, but we hope that we are close to that actual collapse load. Pictorially here, we do the following. Notice here we have the k plotted and the lambda value plotted along this axis. At uh, a particular value, lambda equal to 1, we would have this point. Now let's look first along this axis here. Here we have tk. Here we have t minus delta tk. Notice tk is smaller than t minus delta tk. We are looking here, of course, at a single degree of freedom case again. This means that the structure becomes softer. We are getting closer to the collapse load. In our linearized buckling analysis, we put really through this point and that point a straight line that projects us to a point lambda 1 at which tau k is equal to 0. Corresponding to what we are doing here with the stiffness matrix, we have here also a picture for the loads. Notice t minus delta tr here, tr there, and a straight line through it brings us up to tau r. Tau r is the collapse load. Tau r is the collapse load, linearized collapse load, corresponding to the value that we have here uh, obtained for lambda 1. The problem of solving for lambda such that determinant of tau k is 0 is really nothing else than an eigenproblem. And the eigenproblem that we have to consider there is written down here. Notice phi is an eigenvector. Lambda is the eigenvalue unknown at this point. And uh, here we have a difference in matrices, in matrices that we know, and once again the eigenvector. Notice one interesting point, that to establish this difference in matrix, all you need to do in the computer program is to store the previous stiffness matrix and subtract from the previous stiffness matrix corresponding to load step t minus delta t, the current stiffness matrix. This is interesting to note uh, that uh, because, because we don't need to separate out element stiffness matrices, we don't need to talk about nonlinear strain stiffness matrices coming from the elements and linear strain stiffness matrices coming from the elements. We talked about, of course, these uh, particular element stiffness matrices in previous lectures. We don't separate any out here. In fact, what we're doing, we simply take all of the contributions from the elements into account here, and all of the contributions of the element into account here, of, corresponding, of course, corresponding to time t minus delta t here, and corresponding to time t here. This, therefore, is a very simple operation in a computer program. And uh, having established this eigenvalue problem, we can schematically look at the eigenvalues that would be calculated. Uh, here we have some positive eigenvalues indicated, and here we have some negative eigenvalues indicated. Notice, notice that there's a possibility of negative eigenvalues as well. A physical problem that shows how you can get a negative eigenvalue is shown in this view graph. Here you have a structure frame structure, so to say, that is subjected to a compressive load and a tensile load. Now notice that this compressive load would, of course, initiate buckling here, and that would be corresponding to a positive eigenvalue. However, this tensile load has to reverse its sign in order for this member to buckle, and that would correspond then to a negative eigenvalue. Now when we try to solve eigenvalue problems that have negative and positive eigenvalues, there can be difficulties with the eigenvalue solution method that you're using. It is 
easier for a solution method to simply deal with eigenvalues that are only positive. And for that reason, we are reformulating the basic eigenvalue equation and into this form. Here you have now the eigenvalue problem simply rewritten, really, with gamma being the eigenvalue and phi still being the eigenvector. Gamma, of course, being a function of lambda. With this eigenvalue problem, then, we have only positive eigenvalues on gamma, of course, and we are interested in finding the smallest gamma value because the smallest gamma value corresponds to the smallest lambda 1 positive value. And of course, sometimes we also want to calculate gamma 2 corresponding to the smallest second smallest uh, positive lambda value, and so on. The negative lambda values lie over here. The value of the linearized buckling analysis can be summarized as follows. The buckling analysis is not very expensive. It gives insight into possible modes of failure. For applicability, however, the pre-buckling displacements should be small. And very important it is that the buckling analysis yields modes, buckling mode shapes, that can be very effectively used to impose imperfections onto a structure and to study the sensitivity of the structure to imperfections. Many structures are very sensitive, particular shell structures are very sensitive to initial imperfections in the geometry. And this linearized buckling analysis gives us the mechanism, the means, to calculate mode shapes that we can impose onto the perfect structure as a geometric imperfection onto the geometry of the perfect structure to study then the behavior of the structure subject to these imperfections. But it is very important that the procedure be only employed with great care because the results can be quite misleading. The buckling loads that you might calculate in the real nice buckling analysis, these buckling loads may be way higher than the actual buckling loads that you should be using in your design. And we will actually show some examples in the next lecture pertaining to this particular uh, problem here. And one should always keep in mind that the procedure really predicts only physically realistic buckling loads when we have structures that behave close to the Euler column type. In other words, that buckle with uh, very small initial displacements or pre-buckling displacements, I should say. Let's look at an example. Here we have the example of an arch subjected to uniform pressure. The geometric data of the arch are given here. The material data are given as well. Notice it's an elastic arch. And it's an uh, arch with cross-section B and H here uh, being both equal to 1. We also want to consider only the two-dimensional motion of the arch. In other words, two-dimensional action. We do not allow out-of-plane buckling for this arch. Now, the finite element model that we select for the arch is uh, a model of 10 two-node isoparametric beam elements. We will talk about these isoparametric beam elements. We call them also iso-beam elements in a later lecture. And for the two-dimensional motion of the arch, we uh, model the complete arch. The purpose of the analysis is to determine the collapse mechanism, the collapse load level of the structure, and not only this uh, particular part, but we also want to calculate the post-collapse response of the structure. Let us now go through uh, the solution that was performed for this arch. As a first step, we calculated the uh, linearized buckling loads and corresponding mode shapes, and we calculated two. Interesting to note that the first mode corresponds to this pressure and is an anti-symmetric mode. The second uh, buckling mode shape looks like this, 
it's a symmetric buckling mode shape. Notice that, in other words, the anti-symmetric buckling mode corresponds to a lower load than the symmetric buckling mode shape. Having performed the linearized buckling analysis, we next use our automatic load stepping algorithm to calculate the displacement response of the arch as the load increases. Here on this view graph, we have plotted the pressure vertically up here and the displacement of the center of the arch horizontally. Notice this black curve here shows a computed response using about 60 steps in the analysis. Notice this is a collapse load, of course, here. And this is the post-collapse response. It's interesting to note now that the collapse load predicted using the buckling analysis, the linearized buckling analysis, given by this blue line, lies below this actual ultimate load predicted for using the automatic load stepping alg algorithm. And we have to ask ourselves, why is that the case? Well, the uh, computed response of the perfect symmetric arch does not allow the anti-symmetric displacements to take place. And it is the anti-symmetric uh, displacements that, of course, initialize, so to say, the anti-symmetric buckling response. We have computed the response of a perfect symmetric arch that is subjected to a perfectly symmetric load and this does not allow the anti-symmetric mode, buckling mode of the arch to come into effect. However, a real structure will contain imperfections. And hence, it will go into the anti-symmetric uh, behavior and the actual collapse load will be below the one that we have predicted in our first analysis using the automatic load stepping algorithm and the results of which I've just shown you. Therefore, to really obtain a realistic collapse load, we have to now impose onto the perfect symmetric arch an imperfection, a geometric imperfection, which allows the anti-symmetric behavior to take place. And we do so by adding to the geometry of the arch, to the nodal point coordinates of the arch, a multiple of the anti-symmetric mode shape. Uh, this collapse mode is scaled so that the magnitude of the imperfection is less than 1 hundredth. This resulting imperfect arch is, of course, no longer symmetric. And we now solve for the response of that arch using, automatic, using our automatic load stepping algorithm again. This is the response that you're seeing. Pressure and displacement of the arch. Notice this is well below the linearized buckling analysis solution, the blue solution that I showed you on the earlier response graph. And this is here a much more realistic estimate for the collapse load of the arch. This is a realistic estimate that you would be using for example, in the design of the actual structure. It's also interesting to look at the deflected shape of the structure. And here we have the deflected shape of the perfect arch, of course, being symmetric at this displacement value. And here we have a deflected shape of the imperfect arch for at this particular displacement value. Of course, this one is not a totally symmetric deflected shape. Well, we have discussed now quite a number of solution schemes that we use to solve the fine element equations in static nonlinear analysis. We have looked in the previous lecture at some schemes, the full newton raphson method, the modified newton raphson method, the BFGS method, the initial stress method, in which we have to prescribe the load levels for each load step. We have to prescribe the load level prior to the analysis by the input to the computer program. And in this lecture, I have shared with you some experiences regarding an automatic load stepping scheme and regarding linearized buckling analysis. What we have not done yet really, in my opinion, is to look at enough examples. And that's what I would like to do in the next lecture. Thank you very much for your attention.